First, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, the Hellenic Anti-Corruption Organization for the invitation, and for all of the organizers and planners, thank you for this opportunity. Anti-corruption and whistleblowing is essentially an ongoing movement. When politicians take bribes, democracy is undermined. In fact, you can't have a democratic society if those in power are bribed. On the other hand, major corporations that come into countries like Greece and pay bribes need to be held accountable. In fact, as long as multinational corporations have the ability to pay millions of dollars in bribes, you will never be able to have an effective anti-corruption program. It's hard to say no to large bribes. It's hard for even honest politicians to resist those temptations. So without an effective, systemic, anti-corruption program, you will never succeed in fighting corruption. But an organization and the movement as we see here growing and in other countries, the seeds are planted for an effective response to corruption. I will also state as the presentation, the, the essence of the presentation, is we now know through about 35 years of experimentation that there are specific laws and rules that can effectively detect corrupt activities, allow those corrupt activities to be fully investigated, protect the witnesses, and lead to successful prosecutions. In short, the mechanisms to defeat corruption exist. They just need to be implemented and utilized. And that is the essence of my presentation. In the United States, one of our champions for whistleblowers is Senator Charles Grassley. He's a senior, is one of the highest ranking senior Republican senators. Uh, he's been a champion for whistleblowing since 1980. And it demonstrates that in the United States, members of all political parties, Democrat, Republican, have united to fight corruption. And they've united not because they think it's a good idea, it's a nice thing to talk about. They've united because it works. The laws that have been passed and implemented work. And here's his quote from uh, Whistleblower Day. We have an annual Whistleblower Day now in the United States, July 30th, and this is his quote. Going after waste, fraud, and abuse without whistleblowers is about as useful as harvesting acres of corn with a pair of old rusty scissors. Senator Grassley is a farmer. He's, he's not an attorney, he's been a farmer his whole life, and he knows what it's about to harvest corn, and to harvest corn with rusty scissors. He makes this statement because it is so obvious and simple. Corruption is designed to be secret. Unlike murder, where you see a body lying there dead, and the police can do DNA analysis, fingerprints, ballistics. A bribe is totally different. It is successful if no one knows it ever happened. All fraud and corruption are predicated on hiding the very existence of the crime. So that is telling you that the typical law enforcement tools don't work. And as we have learned over 35 years, and I think it, 
is obvious, that without an insider, someone with knowledge of the operation of these fraudulent schemes, you don't even know the crime happened. So the whistleblower is the key to detection. And detection is the first step to accountability. Consequently, the debate over whistleblowing is passe. It's old. It means nothing. If you want an effective anti-corruption program, you must have whistleblowers. You must incentivize them, protect them, encourage them, bring them out. Without that, you can't detect the crime and you will have no program. It's not an issue of whether you like or dislike the whistleblower. To say it bluntly, who cares? Do you want effective anti-corruption? Yes, no. And you say that to your politicians. Oh, we don't want a whistleblower. It's not Greek. We don't want this. They're informants. They're snitches. OK, we know what you're all about. You don't want to be detected. This is a statement made by a high-ranking government official in the, in the Trump administration. As they say, it's been very bipartisan. Once you see it works. And this is the former assistant acting attorney general, so this person would be in charge of the major whistleblower program in the United States at a very high level. Because those who commit fraud often hide their misconduct from public view, whistleblowers are essential to uncovering the truth. I will just say this. Although I agree with the quote, I don't know why he uses the word often. I have never heard of a politician or anyone who engages in corruption to publicly announce they're corrupt. So I don't think they often hide their corruption. I think they always hide their corruption. And this goes to the core of what you need for a successful detection program, which is encouraging whistleblowers. How do you detect? This is a study done from the University of Chicago School of Economics. As some of you may know, that is not a bastion of liberalism. The Chicago School of Economics is noted as one of the more libertarian and conservative economic programs. They studied over a 10-year period of time every major fraud case to determine how did they get detected. How did anyone ever learn about these frauds? And they determined, objectively, through scientific inquiry, that it's the whistleblower. That at the core of detection was a source. And then they conclude as follows. Honest behavior is not rewarded. Given the costs of whistleblowing, the surprising part is not that most employees do not talk. It's that some talk at all. In other words, why would anyone ever become a whistleblower? Why? It's, it's totally against your self-interest. Unless you have a program that is designed to make it feasible, realistic, to be a whistleblower, you never, it won't happen. And I say that, I've been representing whistleblowers now for 35 years in the United States, and nothing is more true. Yes, you have whistleblowers, some courageous people who stand up and get shot down. They often do great things for society, and they almost always pay a terrible price. And everyone else in society can watch that whistleblower be crucified. 
And guess what? They'll never blow the whistle. What we have seen is that if you depend on this courageous hero to step forward, you'll catch maybe one in a thousand. In other words, corruption is profitable without whistleblowers. Without detection, corruption is profitable. In fact, without real detection, a corporation almost must engage in corruption. If there's a contract worth $100 million and one company can bid for it through bribery and get that contract and make that money and be profitable, but some other company says, oh, I'm too good to pay a bribe. I'm such a nice, honest company. And unfortunately, we went bankrupt last week because the corrupt companies got all the money. Honest behavior is not rewarded in the current situation. So you need to create a system that turns this around, that rewards the honest behavior, that rewards the whistleblower. And guess what? Those systems exist and have been proven to work. And as I'll say further, there, some of those programs are now transnational, applicable in every country in the world. And slowly, we're moving it forward. So where does it all begin? Our modern whistleblower law begins in 1863 at the height of the American Civil War. It was visionary. For the first time in the United States, you had large-scale government contracting. The government started spending, I guess, the equivalent in today's dollars of millions and billions of dollars to fight a major war, defense contracting. And at the moment the government started giving out these contracts and these tenders, we all know what happened. There's a lot of people said they started selling horses that were blind. They started selling the government gunpowder that was sawdust. They sold the government cans of food that was rotten and the soldiers got sick. Fraud in defense contracting is big business. So the, the, the Republican Congress under Abe Lincoln passed a really the first modern whistleblower law known as Quitam. Quitam in the name of the king. It empowered what we now call whistleblowers, they called relators, citizens, to stand in the place of the government itself and to file lawsuits against corrupt contractors and to obtain a reward of 50% of whatever the government made. So anyone with knowledge of fraud could step forward and sue the fraudster. It was designed, and if you look, read the old discussions, to bring in those who were participants in the frauds to turn in their co-conspirators and tackle the problem. Statute was, I call visionary. It was hardly used. Government contracting, as it was seen in the Civil War, ended shortly after the law was passed and the law went into disuse. It was visionary, it set out a vision. And then in 1986, the law was amended, the False Claims Act was amended and modernized to target fraud in government contracting. So what that means is any time a penny of taxpayer money is at issue, the law comes into effect. It covers our entire state-run medical system for any Medicare or Medicaid frauds. It covers education 
that's government sponsored. It covers defense contracting. It covers all procurement and tenders. I won't, I'll go into the specifics later. But let's, and the heart of the law, we'll go into it now, is that the whistleblower can file a claim against the fraudster themselves, give the U.S. Department of Justice all their evidence, initiate an investigation, <coughs> and based on that evidence, the fraudster can be held accountable to major damages, what's known as treble damages, three times the amount. So if that contract was obtained by a bribe, and that contract was for $100 million, that fraudster may be on the hook for $300 million. Without major penalties, no one will be deterred from paying bribes or being corrupt. You need major penalties. The law put in the penalties, and then it gave the whistleblower a minimum 15%, maximum 30% of what the government collected. Whoa, look what just happened. The whistleblower is rewarded by the quality of their evidence and their ability to help the government hold fraudsters accountable. Second, the whistleblower is compensated. They don't have to worry about, can I get my job back? If they, if they win this case, they can obtain millions of dollars. The average recovery is 1.5 million. The largest recovery to date on one of these laws was where one whistleblower was handed a check for $104 million. $104 million. And I know, as I worked on that case, I was the lawyer, the government agency that paid that money wanted us to publicize it, wanted us to go worldwide and tell everybody that whistleblowers can get rewards, change the culture, change the power dynamic. After 30 years, did this whistleblower law work? Did rewarding the whistleblower achieve the goals that Abraham Lincoln thought it could? This is a quote from the U.S. Assistant Attorney General, U.S. government, in charge of this fraud program. So the person with the best knowledge at the highest level. It says everything that needs to be said. I could end my lecture here and we could just talk about details. The False Claims Act, which is that whistle the whistleblower law, is, this is the quote, the most powerful tool the American people have to protect the government from fraud. It says it all because he correctly uses the term the most powerful. Not a, a good law. It works some of the times. No. Most powerful. If you're going to go into a war, do you use your most powerful weapon? And believe me, fighting corruption is like fighting a war. You are fighting a war against corruption. Do you leave your most powerful weapon at home? Do we go into war with bow and arrows? Where the bribesters have tanks? It's almost incomprehensible to me that as this law has worked so well over the past 35 years, that time and time again people have left this most powerful tool back in the garage. 
That's not my problem. Taking it up to 2018, another Trump administration, and I focus on that because it's been bipartisan. The taxpayers owe a debt of gratitude to those who put so much on the line to expose fraudulent schemes. That's the correct attitude towards whistleblowing. Society owes you a debt of gratitude. But not just in the newspapers or among NGOs or anti-corruption organizations. The government itself must not just say those words, but must implement it through policy. OK. How do we know it's the most powerful tool? How do we know it works? This is where I come down to dollars and cents. And some people, oh, is whistleblowing all about dollars and cents? Well, is corruption, is bribery? We figure that out second. But the thing I like about the dollars and cents, it's objective, debate over. In 1986, when they passed the False Claims Act, they did something else. Every time a fraud case is prosecuted, the government has to decide whether there was a whistleblower and whether that whistleblower qualifies for a reward. Thus, they have to quantify whether whistleblowing is effective. It's not about a headline. It's about case after case after case. All the prosecutions, whistleblower, non-whistleblower. We can objectively decide whether this system works. And here it is, 2017. The United States government recovered $3.7 billion from fraudsters. Now, I want to just make a note on this $3.7 billion. Very understated. This is the money actually collected. This is not judgments. I've done many cases. We, we find the fraudster guilty of a crime. We don't get any money out of it. They go to jail, great. Or a fraudster company goes bankrupt. They're prosecuted and they're driven out of the market. Great. This is from companies and individuals who can actually pay and did pay. 3.7 billion collected. And of that, 3.4 billion on the whistleblower cases. 92% of all those fraud cases from whistleblowers. Well, there's another way of thinking of it. Without this law, 92% of those crooks would have gotten away with it. Can't be, that, this is why there's strong support. This is why when they say it's most effective, this is why I get very frustrated. Because these tools exist and they work. But I ask you a question. Why has not one European nation implemented such a law? Not one. Why does the new pending EU directive on whistleblowing totally exclude this? It's not part of it. Zero. I'd like to say, is there a lot of cases in the United States, so uh, someone's got to do something. Figure it out. This little chart shows, on a statistical basis, what happened with fraud recoveries when they passed the False Claims Act in 1986. It's again, we know how much money is collected every year. We know how much comes in from whistleblowers. That line shows how it just has grown year after year after year. It's what you'd expect. Of course, in the beginning, people are afraid. Law is new. No one knows what they're doing. But today, it's very institutionalized. This is the chart published by the United States Department of Justice. Every year, they publish this. It's hard to read, but I hope the PowerPoint is circulated to everybody. You can see it there. It's also available online. If you get the PowerPoint, you can click and come to this chart. It goes every single year how much. So let's just go to the two circles. In 19, 
In 2017, to the far right, the whistleblowers under this one law were paid $392 million in rewards. $392 million. That's what they were paid. And that wasn't for being fired. That's a whole other law. That wasn't for loss of reputation. That wasn't for attorney's fees, all of which they can collect. That's straight reward. And since this law was passed in 1986, whistleblowers have obtained, under this one law, $6.5 billion in rewards. I can tell you right now, one case under this law can generate more compensation for whistleblowers than every single European whistleblower law has paid off to whistleblowers forever. Whistleblowers in Europe are, are devastated. They don't have any rights. But right across the Atlantic, it's all sitting right there. Whatever. I could go for some more quotes. We'll hold on to it. So now I come with another piece of, I think, good news. Because of the success of that law, the False Claims Act, we passed other laws just like it. And many of those laws have international coverage. We don't care here in the United States whether the whistleblower is a citizen of Greece, China, Mongolia. They're fully covered. And we don't care if the crime happened in Nova Scotia, Athens, UK. If it's covered under the law, you can collect. And to make it feasible for those who reside in countries which have no real protection for the whistleblower, and that's pretty much every other country, you can be anonymous. You can collect awards and be totally anonymous. No one will know who you are. Now, I have worked now with the US government, representing clients since 2011 on the anonymous program, and it works. I now recommend my whistleblowers to go in and be anonymous. It, I have whistleblowers from all over the world. Anonymous. Best protection, no one knows who you are. My largest case ever, the company doesn't even know there was a whistleblower. Totally anonymous. I have clients in the control group of companies, executive vice presidents. No one knows they're a whistleblower. It works. But outside of the United States, where there's no realistic protection, it's essential. Let's just start a little bit with the IRS tax law. This is transnational in nature. The whistleblowers tend to be non-US citizens. But the cause of action usually must apply to a taxpayer from the United States. Why is it international? Because the Swiss bankers aren't US citizens. The Swiss bankers, with all the knowledge about the illegal accounts, aren't US. But the law protects and encourages them. So even if they're blowing the whistle is illegal in Switzerland, they can win in America. And no one even has to know who they are. Do they win? This is again from one of the big bosses of the IRS, just saying whistleblowers triggered it. Tax whistleblowers, since they instituted this program, have gotten 429 million in rewards as in five years. They're going to get a lot more. We now know that these tax whistleblowers, almost all of whom are non-US, have resulted in 16 billion in recoveries and Watch this. 
This is from the Department of Justice website. Just go on, type in IRS, uh, uh, Swiss law prosecutions. These are the Swiss banks that had to plead essentially guilty non-prosecution agreements with the Department of Justice paying hundreds of millions and sometimes billion dollars in fines, turning in their U.S. clients, and guess what? Those Swiss whistleblowers are all protected and many of them are unknown. But check it out. This is how many Swiss banks had to plead. And a lot of them are tiny little banks. If the United States can implement a whistleblower program to get the Swiss bankers to turn in all their U.S. clients, what's going on in Greece? Or Italy? Or France? The tools exist. The successes cannot be debated. I've seen it myself. I've had the honor of representing these Swiss bank whistleblowers. Unbelievable. And here's my favorite part. When they paid the first major bank, Swiss bank whistleblower, a large reward, the day after that was announced, there was a meeting in Switzerland of the major banker associations. They essentially declared all U.S. illegal banking dead. Every known U.S. illegal account in Switzerland closed. Every one. 50,000 U.S. citizens had to turn themselves in to the IRS and pay the piper. I have another client from Switzerland right now. He tells me the hysteria that was going on in Switzerland is bank after bank shut down these accounts, would hand the U.S. citizens checks for which they couldn't deposit anywhere. The tools are there. The Swiss Banking Association realized that their bankers could make way more money turning in their U.S. client than servicing them. That fear of detection collapsed the system. But I have my same client, who's a very nice guy, He's engaged, he did money laundering, okay, and other stuff, but he's switched sides. He told me that Switzerland has approximately $12 trillion in illegal dark money still there. He said that the United States was just a small part, and not one other nation in the world has implemented this program. And now we come to my favorite part, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Some of you have heard of it. This becomes, I believe, the most important experiment in worldwide anti-corruption available to anyone in any country with the potential to, in my view, lead the way to a real effective anti-corruption regime. So, going over what the slide says, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act prohibits publicly traded companies, both in the U.S. and international, from paying bribes to foreign officials, and mandates proper record keeping. The FCPA established U.S. jurisdiction, even if the bribe is paid by a foreign national in a foreign country. And since 2010, 2011, they implemented the whistleblower reward provision. They took those best practices from the old False Claims Act and stuck it in foreign corruption. We'll just go to the old map. Since they did this, well, here are the numbers. Up until, this is, uh, up until, I, I believe this would be the latest annual report, September 30th, 2018. Watch this. 2,655 whistleblowers from 113 countries have entered this program. 
The U.S. government has already paid over $30 million to these whistleblowers, non-U.S. citizens. It's probably at least up to $40, $45 million by now. The program is brand new since these investigations take time. There will be hundreds of millions paid. That $30 million paid in the first foreign corruption case was more money paid to an international whistleblower, non-U.S. citizen, than every European whistleblower law combined forever. This just shows the countries all in red in which people have blown the whistle from those countries and come into the United States. This is from Deputy Secretary of Securities Exchange Commission, which has, runs the program. It's very important. These words should be echoed. These words should be enshrined in marble in every anti-corruption office, NGO, worldwide. Enshrined and memorized. It makes no difference whether the claimant, whistleblower, was a foreign national. The claimant resides overseas. The information was submitted from overseas or the misconduct comprising U.S. securities law violations occurred entirely overseas. Bingo. In other words, a bribe paid in Athens by a company covered under this law, the Greek citizen can blow the whistle. The Greek citizen can, be, can win a minimum 10, maximum 30% of what is recovered. And, every, and all the issues all happened in Greece. Yet the United States can obtain jurisdiction. So it is the first time in human history, think of this, this has never happened before that you can fight corruption anywhere in the world through using the legal system of another country, i.e. the United States. You don't have to sweat it out about whether the Greek judges are bribed or whether Greece will have a good law. And obviously if you're blowing the whistle in China or Russia or in Africa in non-democratic societies where you may be killed, you don't have to sit and, and worry about the problems domestically. You can take your information and go to an advanced democratic society and forget politics for a moment. You know, the president comes and goes, whatever. They have institutionalized these whistleblower programs that are fairly immune now to politics. They're just part of the program. They have offices. They have professionals. I, I work in all of them uh, as a private lawyer, and they work. I would never advise anyone to go into a program that didn't work, ever. They work. So for the first time ever in world history, you can fight corruption transnationally. So let's just peel this onion a little bit. Who's covered under this law? A U.S. person. Oh, okay, I guess I'm covered. I'm a U.S. person, so that's kind of easy. U.S. companies, sure. So any U.S. company coming in doing business anywhere in the world. Okay, easy. Subsidiaries. So if I'm a U.S. person or company, I set up a Greek subsidiary, that subsidiary pays the bribe, okay, guilty. Oh, contractors or consultants hired by the subsidiary, okay, fairly simple. You think about that. U.S. company, Greek subsidiary, hires a law firm, law firm hires a consultant, consultant pays a bribe, guilty. Okay, but here's my favorite part. Any company traded worldwide 
that has what's known as an American Depository Receipt Program, ADR. I wanted to change the slide and just have one slide that said A-D-R. I said just go up online and look it up. It's a securities fiction. What it does is say I am traded on the London Stock Exchange or the Paris Stock Exchange or the Athens Stock Exchange, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, the Moscow Stock Exchange. I'm traded outside the United States. I'm a company, I have no employees in America, no property in America, no sales in America, and I'm traded in Paris. However, I want Americans to be able to buy shares in my company. So think about it. If you're going to go public as a major company in Paris or London, wherever, do you want people in the multi-trillion dollar U.S. market to buy stock in your company? The answer is generally yes. And you buy those shares through this concept known as an ADR, American Depository Receipt. And it's, a, it's an instrument in the United States and it's just it's the value of the ADR is the value of the share selling, say, in London or Paris. So it's just an instrument that lets Americans invest in companies that are traded outside the United States. All ADR companies are subject to the F F Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. In other words, you're talking about the int essentially the entire worldwide publicly traded economy. Covered. So what do you get? First, anonymity. Because if, you, if they can find out who you are as a whistleblower, you will be retaliated against. So you get anonymity, meaning no one knows who you are, including the US government. You can come in anonymously. And if your information leads to a, a sanction, mandatory 10 to 30% reward mandatory. So you don't have to guess. You give good information, results in a sanction, you win. Here's another quote from the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission that, in, that m manages the program. This is from December 2018. Whistleblowers, whether they are located in the U.S. or abroad, provide a valuable service and help us stop wrongdoing. The award recognizes the continued important assistance provided by the whistleblower. Now let's just go through some sanctions. September 27, 2018, the Brazilian oil and gas company, Petro Brasilio, had to pay under FCPA a total sanction, you can look it up in the second paragraph, $933 million in disgorgement and $853 million in penalty. That's $1.7 billion in penalties. Will that company think twice before paying another bribe? I hope so. Well, maybe I don't. I could use another client. But uh, $1.7 billion in penalties. So you understand what disgorgement is. Under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, it is designed to take the profit out of corruption. So it's $5 million for the bribe, a penalty up to. $24 million on the record-keeping system. You didn't record your bribe properly. But the big one is disgorgement. All profits made from the bribe. If you pay a $10,000 bribe, but the contract you got makes you $100 million, you owe $100 million, plus all the other fines and penalties. Without an anti-corruption law that strips all the profits and holds people accountable, forget it. Why bother passing it? Here are some international companies, and you can see what they had to pay under foreign corrupt practices. These are non-US companies for bribes paid outside the United States. 
You can just read them. And Lucin, I say I got it for 137 million. I know there was an earlier one against them for 800 million. Whatever, this is just an example. I also wanted to put up an example of if foreign companies do contracting with the US, they love to go after them. They're covered under the old False Claims Act. So here are some companies that had to pay fines under the False Claims Act. We already went through the Swiss bank that paid billions. How are we doing for time? I had an hour. Do you know how much more time I have? Uh, more uh, than, uh, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes, OK. I, we've already summarized these laws, so I don't need to do that again. This is from the former chair of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. There's jurisdiction over foreign corrupt bribery and other securities law violations. What's interesting about her quote is that it's essentially the same as the leaders of the Department of Justice. The folks who monitor these programs all agree. Let's see what she says. The SEC whistleblower program has rapidly become a tremendously effective force multiplier, interesting term, generating high quality tips, and in some cases virtual blueprints laying out the enterprise. Because watch what happens. Because the whistleblower can get an award, it's to their advantage to give the United States government the blueprints, the best evidence. So you, this force multiplier, what you see is you're going to the people who detect, incentivize them to give the best evidence, protect their anonymity, bingo, a successful anti-corruption program. It's not rocket science. I want to address one other issue that's of critical significance. It's called participant coverage. What that means is, if the whistleblower participated in the fraud, can they be a whistleblower? Can someone who's engaged in systemic criminal activity, even for years, become a whistleblower and get money? Can they? It's a very interesting issue. So you, the only way to understand this issue is to view whistleblowing two ways. One is in the news media that covers these heroes that have done extraordinary things and have sacrificed beyond human endurance. Sometimes a movie is made of them. And in the public eye, the whistleblower is this clean, uh, altruistic, you know, savior type. What a great person. Mark my word, an anti-corruption program dependent on that type of person will fail miserably because they're about one in 10,000 if you're lucky. I've seen it with my own eyes. Before these reward alerts, I had a case once in which no less than a thousand employees knew of this incredible risk of public health and safety that could kill thousands of people. They all knew of it and not one person would talk. One chap blows the whistle. One of the thousand and not one of the 999 will be a witness in his favor. And he has a tape recording where one of those 999 admitted to the truth of everything he said on tape. 
And at the trial, denies it all. And the judges look at him like he's gone insane. How can you come before this court and deny what's on the tape? Well, I know why. He's got a job. He's got a family. I lived through that. Because I watched the pain of these poor whistleblowers who were the one in the thousand and couldn't get witnesses, couldn't win their cases. It's terrible. An anti-corruption program that relies upon this hero not only will fail, but will send a terrible message to every other employee. You speak up, you get crucified. So everyone can go to bed and say, oh, what a nice person. No, but I ain't going to be that person. Because I don't want to lose my job, I don't want to lose my income, my retirement, my pension. Okay. So in 1863, when the original False Claims Act was debated, there's an incredible discussion by the senator who proposed the law. And I love these guys because, you know, I, I believe, I'm on the side of the North in the Civil War, the anti-slavery side. I, I grew up in New Jersey. We were fighting the South, and it was a very heroic war. It was a great civil, you know, a civil, as civil wars go, fighting for the right cause. But this guy, they saw so much. And he said, it takes a thief to catch a thief. We need to develop a law that induces the insider to come forward. And that was the entire premise of the first whistleblower law. Before they even knew what the word whistleblower meant. Before they had these heroes that they made movies about. It was about how do you detect and prosecute these people that are destroying the Union Army? Well, we need to bring them out. So this whole issue came to a head in a major Swiss banking case. And this Swiss banker came forward and gave the government all this information about crimes in Switzerland, stealing illegal banks. In doing so, he admitted to participating in hundreds of major frauds. Because he was the banker of people stealing money, hiding their accounts, laundering. He's their banker. So what happens? Case is disastrous. The Justice Department, where he went, and he did not go in the whistleblower program. He went to the Justice Department said, hey, I got all this. Justice said, very nice. Thank you so much for your information. You're now under arrest for illegal banking. It was an easy case for them. The guy comes to us after. Had he come before, none of this would have happened because we wouldn't have taken him where he went. Comes to us after and says, hey, what's up, man? I thought I was a whistleblower. So we then file with the Internal Revenue Service under their whistleblower program. And we have to argue that this guy, who is now a convicted felon, who has admitted to engaging in money laundering and illegal banking for years, who had clients in America with hundreds of millions of dollars, that this guy's a whistleblower and qualifies for an award. So we you know what lawyers do, you know, that's our job. So what occurs? The Internal Revenue Service issues their decision and they say that this whistleblower gave us invaluable information, participants are covered, because without participant coverage we have no program. We will never detect an illegal Swiss bank account without a banker from Switzerland coming in. It'll never happen. We need the bankers. And they draw a line. If you are the kingpin, if you planned and initiated the fraud, well then maybe you're out. You're not a whistleblower. But if you're just a participant, you are. So in other words, they opened up the world to 99% of all the insiders 
who may have engaged in illegal activity. So that precedent, it's true across the board in every program. Participants are covered. But then the IRS did something else, which I'm forever grateful. I met with the head of the office. We had a chat. And in a little discussion, he said this, we're giving your whistleblower the largest reward ever given to an individual, $104 million. This guy went to prison. He's a felon. Can you even phantom that? $104 million. And they said this, if we could have a party in our office, we would. If we could send out the balloons worldwide, we would. If we could literally just blast this out, we would. So I said to him, I said, so I guess we'll do a press conference and announce this award. Thank you very much. He couldn't ask us to do that, and his office couldn't actually had to honor the confidentiality. In fact, no one would even have known this guy got a penny because it's all confidential. It was up to us to make it public. Why did he want it made public? Reasons are obvious. They wanted their banking program to work, and as you saw in the statistics, my God, it worked. After that award was paid, the whole system collapsed in Switzerland for U.S. banking. So there are tools, transnational, and that's my presentation. Thank you so much. I, do we have time for a question or two? Yes, of course. It, I, I'm more than glad to take a question or two if we have the time, but I want to thank you so much for listening so intently. Thank you. And there's the handbook that you can uh, get. Uh, yes? That's a question I've been asking, and it is a point of great frustration to me. I believe that the anti-corruption persons need to rally it up and demand worldwide. In the United States, we've been expanding these programs. Worldwide, silence. That's one of the reasons I'm so happy for the invitation to come here, to talk, to educate, motivate, but until that happens, we're open for business. And I believe that one way that other countries will start implementing is when their citizens come to the United States through our confidential programs, win their cases, all of those monies go to the United States or the whistleblower. Why should the billions of dollars collected under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act all be paid to the United States of America? Why isn't it paid to the Greek people, or the Spanish people, or the German people? You don't have a law to collect. I believe that as international whistleblowers use the law, it will act as an exemplifier and promote these laws to go worldwide. So until they do, you have an option, but I think it needs to be pushed. Yes? Now, these acts are obviously passed by Congress, right? Correct. So uh, I, I believe that uh, because in foreign countries, the Senate would have to pass these laws, which in turn would put targets on all of their heads. So I think the difficulty is trying to get passed in the Senate yeah, so the, the question is quite simple, which is, will politicians enact a law that can result in them all being found guilty of bribery? Uh, that's not my problem, unfortunately. That's your problem. That's what you've got to deal with. But I will say, and I'm a big supporter of this, uh, to be realistic. So there's, nothing, like, so there's nothing to stop someone from passing this law, but making it only apply in the future so they don't apply in the past. Uh, so for example, we fought this, but we did not win. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act only covers whistleblowers who have made their disclosure after the law was passed. In the False Claims Act, they decided the same thing. It would cover whistleblowers 
in the future, it would not be what's known as retroactive. Uh, people fought it, they didn't win. So 10 years later, it's not a big issue. But when the law was first passed, it was. But again, it's politics. So there are ways to soften the blow, but at some point you have to hope that the politicians of a country do the right thing or are forced to do it by their people. Yes? No, wait, wait. My question would be... A I have... Long. Okay, if you Where have. did my thing go? In your leg. <laughs> ah. Ε, θα ήθελα να ρωτήσω το εξή, σαν και λέξει μια σε γλώσσα των κ. Καρφλό εδώ στην Αθήνα. Ε, εάν έχουμε μια κατάθεση σε δικαστήριο, ποινικό δικαστήριο, για σοβαρή υπόθεση, δολοδοκία, έστω ή απάτηση ή υπεξαίρεση, στην Αμερική πώ λειτουργεί το σύστημα, η ακατάθεση ενό μάρτυρα που έχει μπει στο πρόγραμμα του whistleblowing είναι νόμιμη και υποχρεωτική, έστω υποχρεωτική, θα, θα εκτιμηθεί από το δικαστήριο ή θα βρεθεί κάποιος δικαστής και θα του πει «Ξέρεις, αυτά που καταθέτεις είναι παράνομα, διότι αντίκειται στο τραπεζικό απόρριτο, αντίκειται στην GDPR, στην παραβίαση του προσωπικού δεδομένου, έστω και αν είναι σοβαρά δικήματα, ή μόνο σε σοβαρά δικήματα μπορούμε να δεχτούμε την κατάθεσή σου διαφορετικά δεν τη δεχόμαστε, διότι θα είναι άκυρη η απόφασή μας και θα διωχθεί εσύ ποινικά. Ευχαριστώ. Επίσης ένα άλλο, συγγνώμη, πώς ορωθείτε η διαφορά μόνο σε σχέση σοβαρά δικήματα επεξαίρεσης ή δωροδοκίας. Μόνο δωροδοκία δεν μπορούμε να πούμε whistleblowing για όλα τα σοβαρά δικήματα που εμπεριέχουν μια ποινική απαξία. Διαφθορά, διαφθορά είναι τα πάντα. Μόνο το bribery. Sure. Uh, great question. So, so let me go to the first one. Or, and, and you may have to remind me of the second, but I think I'll remember. Bank secrecy laws don't apply in the United States. In the United States, we have something known as the a statute called obstruction of justice. An obstruction of justice, the law was amended in 2002 to cover whistleblowers explicitly. It, it pretty much covered them before. They made it explicit. The law states as follows. Any person who interferes with the livelihood of any other person because that person gave truthful information about a possible crime to law enforcement is guilty of a serious criminal felony subject to 10 years in prison. Period. No exception. So if I have evidence that a bank is engaged in criminal activity, and I give that to our government through the whistleblower program or not, just I give it. And that bank tries to come after me on some bank secrecy nonsense. Put that banker in jail, 10 years. This statute creates the overriding public policy that must exist as a pillar of democracy. The right of the people to report crimes to the appropriate authorities. And no law, bank secrecy, trade secrecy, personal secrecy, nothing can interfere with that. And the example is quite simple. If you are sitting in your office or at home and you're watching someone get mugged, robbed on the street by some thug, and they grab, say, an old woman's pocketbook and run. Do you call that thug's parents? Do you go to the compliance office of the school? No. It is hoped and expected you call the police immediately and report that crime. And if a banker goes in and is taking money out of all your pockets, or a drug company, 
taking money out of all your pockets by increasing the price of drugs? Do you have to sit and worry? No. Report it to the police and any society that does not permit the reporting of crime to the appropriate authorities is not, cannot be democratic. It's the pillar of the rule of law. So the answer is the two go together. When the whistleblower comes forward with their information, they don't have to worry. Now when they give it to the government, when it doesn't exist in Europe. Believe me, I know, I have European whistleblowers. I, I take them to America. I see the laws here. I can't believe it. But, so I think it answered yours. Now, I can't remember the second question. <laughs> I knew that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. The reward law, we have whistleblower laws covering almost everything. Safe food environment, uh, airline safety, automobile safety. We have, we have laws everywhere. These reward laws have been passed more recently, one at a time, because they've worked. So they cover securities fraud, commodities fraud, tax fraud, money laundering, bank fraud, foreign corruption, some other areas. They're done specifically. But let me tell you what has happened, because I've seen it. The government prioritizes the cases. With these reward laws, you get thousands of credible cases. Thousands. It's not a handful. So the government prosecutor's office has to prioritize. And generally, the prioritization is on two issues. First, the amount of money to be collected, the size of the crime. I support that. You want to go after the biggest criminals. Send the message, etc. But then they have a secondary consideration, public policy. So for example, we did a case of fraud where people were stealing from a disaster relief program. Okay? They were stealing from disasters, train wrecks, tornadoes. So they prosecuted that case. They almost got no money, but all of, the, all of the culprits went to prison, and the company was bankrupted. I did another case on bulletproof vests that didn't work. They went against the company, the company went bankrupt, the amount of recovery was small. So the Justice Department now has this, what I would call this dual process. Cases that raise major public policy issues, and they don't care about the amount of money, and then large cases. Our position is that's okay now, but we support expanding these programs, giving more money to the prosecutors, that they're highly profitable. These, these programs are, are profiting billions of dollars they're making for the government. So we support turning some of that money back to increase the number of cases. That's politics, but that's how it's done. So it's not as, they will go after really bad people and bad things, even if it's a small case. Time for what? One more question, maybe. Pro decapede eton, ξεκίνησα να εργάζομαι στην τρίτη τράπεζα κατά σειρά που έχω εργαστεί. Τότε διαπίστωσα ότι υπήρχε μια κατάσταση στην οποία υπήρχαν αυτό που λέμε μαύρες μισθοδοσίες, αδίλωτες. Τις αρνήθηκα. Ήμουν διευθυντή στο κατάστημα που ήμουνα. Όταν άρχισα να τις αρνούμε με ένταση, αντιμετώπισα 13 μεταθέσεις μέσα σε 15 μήνες, σε χρονικό διάστημα 15 μηνών, και μετά από όλα αυτά πήρα την απόλυσή μου, χωρίς να περάσω πειθαρχικό, χωρίς να γίνει καμία νόμιμη διαδικασία. Ξεκινώντας μετά από αυτό το στάδιο, επήρα ένα πακέτο χαρτιά σημειωτέων ότι πριν ε, απολυθώ είχα απευθυνθεί στα προϊστάμενά μου κλιμάκια στον πρόεδρο της τράπεζας ως όφυλα. Και μετά τον πρόεδρο της τράπεζας 
αντιμετώπισα την απόλυση. Μετά την απόλυση, επήρα ένα πακέτο χαρτιά και τα πήγα στην Εισαγγελία Διαφθοράς. Γνωρίζω ότι η Εισαγγελία Διαφθοράς επήγε να κάνει ελέγχους, αλλά η τράπεζα επικαλέστηκε το απόρριτο των καταθέσεων. Η Εισαγγελία Διαφθοράς έκλεισε τον φάκελο ως αγνώστου δράστου και από το 2011 που έχω απολυθεί μέχρι και χθες συγκεκριμένα που δικαζόμουν στο πενταμελές εφετείο κακουργημάτων με μάρτυρες της τράπεζας τον Γενικό Διευθυντή Οικονομικών Υποθέσεων ήταν από αυτόν που περνούσαν όλα τα οικονομικά τον τέος πρόεδρο της τράπεζας διότι απελήθηκε αυτός λίγο πρόσφατα πριν από 1,5 χρόνο και άλλους έξι και άλλα έξι μεγαλοστελέχη της τράπεζας αναρωτιέμαι τι περισσότερο μπορεί να κάνει κάποιος πολίτης όταν μέσα σε αυτά τα χρόνια έχει απευθυνθεί σε δεκάδες μεγαλοδημοσιογράφους σε δεκάδες αρχές μεταξύ των οποίων και την Επιτροπή ε, 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 Ναι, τελειώνω, σύμφω, μισό λεπτό στον Οργανισμό ε, Ανθρωπίνων Δικαιωμάτων και μάλιστα ήταν παρουσία και βουλευτών της ελληνικής κυβέρνησης και δεν σας κρύβω ότι απευθύνθηκα και στην Αμερικανική Πρεσβεία για να δώσω στοιχεία διότι και το Αμερικανικό Δημόσιο έχει στην τράπεζα τη συγκεκριμένη bonds και η Αμερικανική Πρεσβεία μου λέει θα πας να τα δώσεις στην ελληνική δικαιοσύνη όταν τους είπα ότι τα έδωσα και τον φάκελο τον κλείσανε μου λέει δεν μπορώ να σπάνω τίποτα και το κλείσε ευχαριστώ πολύ Okay, great. Okay. So first off, I appreciate what you've gone through. I've represented whistleblowers for 35 years, and your story is, as you know, not unique, not just in Greece, but worldwide and in the United States. And without effective laws, and Greece does not have them, you can't win. I want to touch on the bank secrecy because I couldn't agree more, and it is so bad. I'm currently doing a case on behalf of a whistleblower from the Donks Bank, you may have read about it, uh, who uncovered a money laundering scheme that turns out to be $230 billion, correct, $230 billion, you can look it up in the Google, from Russia through the Donks Bank, primarily to the United States, and then worldwide. We already have tracked down bribes that have been paid. These are illegal companies, complete. If you think about 230 billion money laundered and how that could be used in countries around the world for terrible things, it's a major crime. So my client is contacted by the Danish prosecutor. Would you please give testimony about this crime? Well, my client was forced to sign a non-disclosure secrecy agreement as an employee of the bank. So we contact the prosecutor and we say, hey, he's got a non-disclosure. The prosecutor tells us that there's nothing they can do about it. In the United States, this would be obstruction of justice. How can a prosecutor say that the bank that's engaged in massive money laundering can control the testimony of the witness. How can that be? Well, the prosecutor goes to Donks Bank and Donks Bank gives a waiver and say, okay, he can testify, but no waiver of bank secrecy, no waiver of, of personal data, European Union. So we meet with the prosecutor, and the whistleblower cannot identify by name any of the people who were doing the money laundering. Bank secrecy. can identify by name the phony companies used to hide the money. Bank secrecy 
can't identify who worked in the bank. Data protection. And the prosecutor went along with it. Yeah. I do not think the European system is working. And I understand what you've been going through, and I hope there is some justice at some point. I really do. I'm very sorry to hear. But what you've lived through is endemic, not just here in Greece, in Denmark, throughout Europe. And that's why I'm here to say there is hope through the US programs. Uh, you also mentioned you went to the embassy. I'll tell you now, most embassies are totally unaware of any of the US whistleblower programs. They're, they're still relatively unknown. I talk to prosecutors, they don't know about it. I talk to people from the State Department, they don't know. One of the reasons I'm here, I'm so happy for this invitation, was try to get the word out. But we are where we are. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. One more question, uh, Mr. Cohn. Oh, okay. Sure. Hey, θα δώσω το λόγο στον κύριο Αναγνωστάκη, στον συνάδελφο, γιατί είχε προηγηθεί, είχε ζητήσει να υποβάλει μια ερώτηση. <laughs> ναι, ναι, ναι. Αυτό για λόγους ισότητας, γιατί είχατε προηγηθεί και δεν σας είχα δει. Okay. Και μετά θα κάνουμε το διάλειμμα. My question concerns the case where the identity of a whistleblower, for a reason, by any chance, is revealed. It goes public. Uh, my question refers to what happens. Does the criminal immunity still, still, uh, still applies, or it, the, the whistleblower loses this, his status, his or his status, and if this is, let's say, compatible with the principle of protection, of effective protection of the whistleblower, because there is uh, publicly that it, there is such a case, and there are still questions about how to handle this uh, situation. Sure. Okay, so the question concerns protection of confidentiality and what happens if that protection is not honored. So let me explain the, the law that governs Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, because each law is a little different, so you get an understanding, and then we can directly answer your question. So the whistleblower can file the claim through a U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney signs the complaint, has to swear that there is a whistleblower, that this is the whistleblower's information. So even though the whistleblower may be from Greece, the U.S. attorney can be held accountable if there's fraud or misconduct. So they, they require someone that our government can hold accountable. The issue has never arose, but you can see that. So now we file this case anonymously. The law says that this whistleblower has the right to anonymity. So let's assume someone from the government leaks out their name. <coughs> That's all it would really come from. Because there is a law that grants the whistleblower a right to anonymity, it is my legal opinion that no agency of the United States government could use that illegal leak in a manner to the detriment of the whistleblower. And in fact, it would be my opinion that that identity could not be introduced in any court of law ever because it was illegal. It's similar to how the United States has dealt with other illegal leaks, such as uh, information that was published on WikiLeaks and other types of these sites where the US government has essentially said, you, no one can use this information, period, done. So even something like the Panama Papers could create an issue in the United States if they were stealing, say, from a lawyer's office. But so this has not happened yet. In the, since the law was passed, I know of no case where the government has messed it up and revealed the identity. But the way the law is drafted, it gives the whistleblower a legal entitlement to that confidentiality. And I believe that that entitlement 
would run all the way through. I just want to, I think this question came up, it's kind of a, related. If the whistleblower remains anonymous and confidential, how can they ever testify in court? And if they can't testify in court, how do you win your case? Okay, fair question. It, it, it came up somewhere. Uh, over 95% of all the cases settle before trial. In the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, almost all of the cases against the corporations settle. And they settle because the sanctions under those laws are very, very large. Very large. <coughs> so if a company can get out of some of those sanctions by pleading guilty, by doing what's known as deferred prosecution, they will. Because they will bankrupt you. They, had, they, they went after the oldest bank in Switzerland criminally and bankrupted the bank. So they sent a message. So most of the cases settle. Now let's go to the very few that don't and you need a witness. Okay, you live here in Greece. You're the big witness. It's a big case. Question for you. Do you want to fly over to America and testify and qualify for $25 million? Or do you want to stay home and pay your electric bill? So in all, my, in all the cases that I have worked, and this has not happened much, but the whistleblower usually consents to the release of information so they can win the case. And when you're asked to do that, it generally means it's a really good case. But what's nice is if you walk in anonymously and they never pursue your case, you don't have to worry. It's not like it's all going to come out. So it's a negotiation, but so far it has worked without a flaw. So I can feel comfortable telling a foreign audience that they can have trust in the anonymity proceeding, procedures. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.